going to introduce uh, Dr. Mark Windham. And uh, Mark and I go back quite a ways. I got, I got to say that he was probably the first research guy I met when I came down from Michigan to, um, to uh, Tennessee. He invited me to look out mountain, to look at dogwoods. And that was such a revelation. He just taught me so much and ever, ever since, I think that's been 25, 26, maybe longer. I realized what a, what a treasure he's been from or to Tennessee. He got his degrees from Mississippi State and North Carolina State. And um, he's been a professor over, I won't say how many years, over 30 years, but he's been over 30 years. But I want to say the one thing about Mark that I really was taken is that he makes science a lot of fun. He's, um, he's done a lot of research with dogwoods, like I said. He's one of the dogwood docs that bred a lot of dogwoods. One of the funny stories, and Mark will have to tell me if this is true. I got two, two little stories I wanna tell on you, Mark. One is uh, about dogwoods. I heard that when you were searching for the dogwood anthracnose resistant, you went up to Camp David, got out of your car and found a little seedling that was growing. Everything else is, all the other dogwoods are dead. You found this resistant dogwood, tried to start back in your car and the CIA showed up and uh, maybe patted you guys down or at least talked to you and said, what are you guys doing up here? And you got out of there and the rest was history and you turned some of that material into some of the great dogwood material that we have nowadays that people can buy by a dogwood, either a anthracnose resistant or a powdery mildew one. And so uh, you'll tell he's shaking his head. Maybe that wasn't true. <laughs> but the other one, um, the other, the other story I want to say is um, we used to do a research um, meeting with all the pathologists and all the entomologists up at a place near Linville, North Carolina, called Cross North Forestry Facility. So we all camped in our up there basically in a bunk bed and everything. And we'd have a good time. We'd have a lot of research going on too, but every so often in the afternoon, we could all do something fun. And so Mark said, who wants to go for a walk up in the mountains or up in the high hills around the cross north? <laughs> and I said, I'll do it. Cause, uh, and we were both in better shape. I, I got to admit back then. And we took off up in the hills and uh, we got up, gosh, we must have been up a thousand feet up in the up above where our camp was. And Mark said, I know, I know we can get down there. Let's just get off the trail and just start going down straight down to the camp. And we started going through the most crowded and thickest rhododendron bushes you ever believed. And, yeah, but we made it. We made it in time for uh, supper. A little late, but we made it in time. And I'll never forget that. That was quite a, quite a hoping going down that. And so he's done a lot of research with dogwoods, hydrangeas, and now he's kind of picked up roses. You know, roses had this terrible disease, rose rosette, and he's done a lot, a lot with that over the years. Looking up his history, and again, um, amazing. He doesn't just, you know, he makes science fun. He makes everything fun when you're around Mark, and I'm sure he'll have fun with us today. The other thing I just didn't realize until today was that he's been teaching another course at um, at University of Tennessee. I don't know if he's still doing it, but he's been teaching a course on SEC history, Southern Athletic or Southern um, whatever it means, SEC football. He's an expert on football. He gets invited all over the Southeast to talk about SEC football, and he also teaches that class. So maybe he'll he'll enlighten us with a little trivia today. So uh, <laughs> I appreciate it, Mark, and thank you for coming. It is so great to be here. You know, I really don't like noon meetings because I never know what to say to people. It's not good morning and it's not afternoon yet. It's noon. So uh, I'm always at a loss saying good noon. This just seems odd. But Tom, I have to correct you. I was arrested. It was by the Secret Service. Oh, yeah. Uh, that tree was about was about 300 meters or so in the woods across from the gate of Camp David. And uh, my first trip up there, they didn't know who I was. And uh, what I did not know, that was during the 
uh, first President Bush's uh, uh, tenure as president. And it was at the beginning of Desert Storm. And President Bush and the president of Turkey were due at that gate within the hour when I walked in the woods. Uh, the Park Service was supposed to tell them that I was up there and why. And because of a traffic emergency, they forgot to notify the camp. And so uh, I was arrested. Uh, my wife was down at the visitor center. When I finally got released and got back to the visitor center, the only question she wanted to an answer to was, did they pistol whip me? And that was the only thing that uh, she, that was the only question that she asked. Okay, uh, enough on that. Uh, we're going to talk about roses today. And I'm a plant pathologist. So my first fault is always diseases of roses. If I have to, insect pest of roses. And because they're very minor compared to diseases and nowhere near as interesting. Uh, to our plant pathologist. But on the other hand, that's not what we're doing today. Today, we're going to talk about roses, how to grow them, um, various components of that. And uh, But before we do, but what I was going to say is just a little bit about the history of the rose. Uh, a Greek philosopher who lived uh, between 600 and 570 B.C., declared roses the queen of flowers, and they have been known that ever since. Then the ancient world, uh, Persians, Egyptians especially, used rose oils and waters as perfumes because there were no deodorants, and they were in very hot climates, and they were also used, or rose oils were used in medicines. Uh, back to the deodorant thing, uh, the Romans, I uh, love to have big piles of rose petals around when they had banquets to sort of give a pleasant fragrance to the room. Uh, the Emperor Nero must have been having a banquet with a lot of stinky people because uh, it is documented that he dropped oh, so many rose petals on the participants at a banquet that some of the people were covered with 12 feet of rose petals. And they suffocated. Uh, the number of petals that he dropped on that thing would have cost him millions of dollars today. Uh, Josephine, uh, Empress Josephine of France, her, her husband was in a little, uh, was having some issues with his neighbors across the channel, and they were in a war, but her garden had more rose cultivars and rose species in it than any other garden in Europe. She had over 250 cultivars. Even though the British had a very strict um, blockade against the French to keep French ships from resupplying Napoleon's armies, if they stopped a ship and it had roses for Josephine's garden, regardless to whatever munitions they may have been carrying, the British fleet were ordered to let the ship go through. That's just how well known and thought of Josephine's garden was. It was considered an international treasure. So this gives you some idea of how roses have been very important uh, in history. They're important today. Uh, when you look at the propagation of roses, the wholesale sale of roses, the re-wholesale sale of roses, the retail sales of roses, and all the other stuff that goes into growing roses. Roses contribute more than a billion dollars annually to the U.S. economy. So they were important in the past. They're important today. And there are so many kinds of roses. Uh, first of all, you know, uh, we're diploid. We're two in. We have... We have uh, uh, one pair of chromosomes. So that, that's what makes us two in because they're paired. And uh, But most of the roses we deal with and grow today are six and eight in. Makes breeding with these things just a nightmare. And I'm involved in some of that. 
I don't think I would have been if I had known that at the beginning. But anyway, uh, most of the roses we think about are hybrid teas. These are single stem roses. They can have five petals. They can have many petals. Uh, the rose that I chose is Peace, which you see there is a hybrid tea. The Floribunda, I, I took it uh, because, I, because uh, I know Tom. The name of that rose is Playboy. And uh, anyway, uh, I put that one in there intentionally because it's a five-petal rose. So that you see a difference between a multi-petal rose and a five-petal rose. Uh, another bush rose are the polyampha roses. Uh, such as ballerina. And what's interesting is uh, Floribunda has five to seven blooms uh, per stem or cluster, uh, hybrid T1, and you get uh, the grandifolias. You may hear of these. They're very similar to hybrid teas, but they come in clusters of usually three. And, uh, you know, a rosarian, uh, some rosarians like to put roses in rose shows. And so what they will do is they will pinch off those other two roses uh, and just have the center rose because when you do that, it gets incredibly big compared to a, a regular hybrid tea. And they do this because they want to try to win a prize. Now, uh, there are other kinds of roses. There are a lot of shrub roses. Uh, these include antique roses. Most antique roses are shrub roses. Uh, many ro most roses species are some antique roses are climbers. We'll talk about them in a minute. You have modern roses that sort of mimic antique roses, but there are modern roses. The David Austin roses would be these, and those would be under English roses. Uh, hybrid musk are a specialized type of roses. They have a lot of forms. Ricosa roses are native to the eastern United States. Uh, and uh, Rosa Ragosa, uh, they're pretty hardy. And then we have modern shrub roses like the knockouts. Uh, knockout rose, double knockout, uh, pink knockout, double pink, rainbow knockout. Um, that there's just a, a, a number, a double knockout. There's just a number of these that would be known as modern shrub roses. But there are other types, the climbers. Uh, in my backyard, uh, I have some cats who really like to go after the birds on my bird feeders. So I put a miniature climbing rose. It's very far thorny, but it only grows to about five feet high and it grows right up around my bird feeder, but I can still reach in and put the seed without getting scratched. But the thorns discourage the cats from getting up on, on that bird feeder. But climbing roses can be quite large. Uh, the one that's in the picture is uh, over 20 feet across and, it, and is uh, about 12 feet high. So they can be quite big. Uh, the largest climber in the United States is located in Arizona, and it is bigger than a house. So climbers can be quite big. Uh, tree roses are... They come and go as far as popularity goes. But uh, just about any bush, whether it is a miniature or a hybrid tea or a floribunda can be converted into a tree rose. That's just growing a main stem and then doing the graft union way up high. And, uh, but, uh, but there are people who grow them. I have many times in my own yard. Uh, miniature roses. These are like hybrid teas or floribundas, but they're very small. Um, you can also buy miniature roses as a floral rose at a florist or a grocery store. Those roses don't do too well outside and neither do floral roses. And the reason why is because they're designed to bloom and hold their blooms. They're not designed to be hardy outside. Um, miniature roses that you buy at a nursery from outside, um, they're designed to do well in full sun. You put one of those miniatures inside in a pot and it'll drop its leaves because it doesn't get enough sunlight. So uh, the miniatures in a grocery store, the miniature that's outside uh, at a nursery, well, two very 
two very different roses. It's sort of like Tom and I. Uh, Tom is from north of the Mason-Dixon line. I don't know if he does or not, but I would say there's a much greater chance that he eats Brussels sprouts. I right. won't even stay in the room with one. <laughs> and so uh, it's uh, uh, just different things. So what do roses need when we go to select a site? Uh, roses need full sun. Uh, they'll grow in partial shade, but if they, if you put them in partial shade, disease pressure is going to be worse. Uh, they don't do as well with disease in partial sun as they do in full sun. The blooms will be smaller and there won't be as many of them. Roses do not like wet feet. So if you are going to put them somewhere, you want to put them where there's good drainage, uh, on a slope, and uh, although I've seen some roses not do well on a slope because they put them on a slope where the water from higher up the slope drained right across them. Well, that's might as well put them down in a swamp there. So uh, uh, they, they don't like wet feet. But you can put them in an area where there's problems with drainage, providing that you put them in raised beds or on berms. Berms are just long, big mounds of dirt where the water can get away from the root systems of the roads. And so that type of thing are things that we are going to try to, uh, to do to keep roses happy. All right, now, we've selected a site for roses, but you want to make sure there's water nearby. Because next to sunlight, the most important thing for a rose is water. And I've learned this from my own experience. You don't want to put the beds where you don't have water in there. Dragging around a long hose is, is a pain. And I never buy the real expensive hoses, so they're going to kink. And so uh, you want a water source, if possible, nearby. You want to put them in an area that has good air circulation. In other words, don't put them in a the corner of fences uh, where the air circulation isn't really good. And and roses are going to grow. So unless you're growing little miniatures, never put them within 24 inches of a wall. Now, roses are sold multiple ways. Uh, bare root roses. Uh, if you order roses, mail order, that's most likely the way they're going to come. They're going to be dormant when they come. Here we are again. So we're at this one. And look at the bare root rose that's dormant. Uh, the roots have been pruned. Okay, the roots have been pruned. So there's not a lot of feeder roots there. So you got to plant this rose early. A bare root rose in Tennessee, you plant it in May or June, you're in trouble. It's, you know, when the, the foliage is going to come out, but the root system won't be established. So you need to be planting those roses in February or March. Um, if you buy a rose at a nursery that's in a container, they got that rose probably in January and uh, put it in a pot. It's been in a poly house. The root system's been growing vigorously before the foliage came out. And uh, that rose is going to do really well. Of course, it's a little more expensive. But that's, what, that's, that's the way I do. And then you can buy these things in packages as well as that's on the road. And uh, they, they have, they, they, you can plant them a little later than you can a, a dormant bare root rose. But, um, you know, paying a little extra money, knowing exactly what you've got with a vigorous root system, in my opinion, is probably the way to go when you're recommending roses. Now, uh, roses can be grown in containers, and they do quite well in containers. Uh, I grow a lot of miniatures in containers. I know some rosarians that their entire rose gardens are in containers. Uh, the containers should have good drainage. It needs to have holes in the bottom. Uh, this is not a time to use garden soil. You want to use a light garden mix. Uh, there are a number of these on the market. I like miracle Grow Moisture Control. It's a little more expensive, but it's an easy can't miss solution to growing roses in containers. And I'm always looking for easy because I don't have time to redo things. Uh, a friend of mine, you know, to whatever we're having, 
uh, sent me this picture of her garden just a few days, rose garden. And as you can see, all of her roses are in containers. And when I asked her why she did this, she says she's older. She doesn't like to bend over. It requires less weeding, it requires less mulching. Mulch goes a much longer way when you're just mulching the top of the pot. Uh, she doesn't, she uses such big pots. She doesn't really worry too much about winter protection. And she lives a lot farther north than we are. Although that, if you lived in Crossville, then your roses might be looking like this right now. Um, she started small. She started with six containers and she's added new containers and new roses over the years. And uh, she has a beautiful garden and uh, she has this right out by the front in her front yard. She has, she has about a hundred more containers in her backyard, but her neighbors and people driving by slow down to look at her roses in containers when they're in bloom. bloom. So uh, if you're planting a container rose, you're going to put it in the pot. You're going to spread dirt out, but this also works or if you're growing, putting things in the ground, whether it, you bought it in a container or as bare root, what you want to do is make sure that the graft union is covered because that gives winter protection. You don't want that graft union, and that's where all the shoots are coming out, out of unless it is a own root rose, which are not commonly encountered at nurseries. Uh, usually they're going to be grafted or budded and there'll be a big ball uh, just above the roots that will have all the shoots coming out of it. Make sure that ball that the shoots are coming out of it are below, are, are below the soil line. When you plant them, mud them in. Uh, I fill this hole with soil and I have the water hose at the bottom of the hole. hole. And then I turn it on to a, more than a slow trickle, but still a trickle. And I let that hole fill up with water. And then I grab one of those canes and I shake it to get all the air bubbles out. That will cause the soil to settle. And then I'll have to put some more soil back in. And then I turn the water back on and let it flood again. It's called mudding them in. Now, this is a great way to plant a rose. It's something that is real important. And that's when you dig the hole, especially in East Tennessee, we have heavy clay soils. Roses will go, grow well in clay, but, but the key is when you dig that hole, you want to make sure you make a ugly hole. When I was in college, I didn't have any student loans. My brothers didn't have any student loans because we worked for a company where we worked a minimum of 10 hours a day, seven days a week, all summer. We wouldn't, the only day off we got was July 4th. And, uh, and what we did was we dug holes for footings for football bleachers. So a small job would have six to 800 holes. A large job might, hold, might have thousands of holes to dig, two foot cubic holes and they had to be pretty holes. They had to have straight sides and a flat bottom. An ugly hole was what you want to use in clay. And there you take your shovel once you've dug the hole and you tear the sides of the hole up. Because when you push that shovel in, and I have dug hundreds of thousands of holes when I can include all those holes I dug in three summers while in college. When you dig that hole, and you push that shovel into clay. If you have a pretty hole, you have an unfired clay pot. And water is not going to perk into the hole when you need it. And it's not going to be able to perk out of the hole when you've had a heavy rain. So the water just sits there. And now you have a rose and wet feet. So we've got to tear the sides of that hole up, score it with that shovel. You know, once you put the rose in and you put the soil in and you put the mulch across the top, none of the neighbors will know you started with an ugly hole. Okay? They won't know. It'll be just a little secret only known to you and the rose and the rose will thank you. Okay, mulch, pine bark, hardwood bark, sawdust, pine straw, uh, 
pine straw is my favorite. And the reason why it's my favorite, what good is it to have a bunch of roses if you're not walking among them smelling, smelling the blend? So we're going to put, put them far enough apart so I'm not getting scratched. And I like to smell them. Pinewood bark, hardwood bark, sawdust as well, but not as much as pine bark and hardwood bark. If you walk on it a lot, you'll compress it. And when you compress it, it becomes hydrophobic. No matter how much I walk on pine straw, it's very resilient. And it will just bounce back up. And it never becomes hydrophobic. In other words, the water will run, go run through it. It won't run off. And if you're in a high traffic area, which rose gardens often are, pine bark and hardwood bark over time will compress down as you walk on it. How deep? We don't want volcanoes. Three to four inches is plenty. Uh, the benefits of mulch is you don't have to water as often. The rose root systems are much more vigorous if they're not overheated. And even if you use containers, I didn't mention that. If you know, I have grown roses in those big black nursery containers, but you know that big bushes come in or trees come in, and uh, I just paint them white. I get some the cheapest latex exterior paint I can get, and I just paint the pots white before I put them in there. It's remarkably how much better that rose will grow in a container if it's not dark, because the roots don't like that much heat. Irrigation. Uh, roses require a lot of water, and so that's why mulch is so good, so we don't have to water so often. Uh, for disease control, it's important to try to keep the foliage dry. And there's all different ways. Uh, a watering can is in that picture. Uh, that would just be an incredible amount of work. I, I'm not into that. Uh, you can use a, a hose, but it, this takes too much time if you got more than a half dozen roses. And once again, you're lugging them around and they're going to kink. Uh, you'll, you'll know by the end of the day, but I have a, I don't have a love hate affair with hoses. I have a hate affair. I use them all the time, but my roses uh, uh, they enjoy kinking on me, no matter what I do, and so uh, that's a problem. Overhead sprinklers you can move them around. You can put them down and walk away, uh, like a hose, and uh, they're less labor intensive. But it gets the foliage wet. So if some if one of your clients wants to use uh, overhead sprinklers. You need to tell them, let the foliage dry for at least an hour in the morning before you turn the sprinkler off. And you want to turn the sprinklers off in the afternoon at least an hour before sundown to give the foliage a chance to dry. When we talk a little bit about diseases at the end, you'll understand why. And so uh, this is a way. Soaker hoses, these are great. They're cheap. You can attach them together. They work best on level ground. Uh, you can hide them under the mulch. Uh, I've done this many times, but they become a spade hazard because I forget where they are and, I, and I'll and i be digging a hole and I will chop on, I'll chop one in two and then I have to repair it. And always makes, it takes time. Uh, but, uh, but these can be uh, very effective ways to supply water. Uh, without getting the foliage red. Of course, drip irrigation is what, if you got a lot of roses, this is what I would recommend. Uh, remember though, when people are putting in drip irrigation to remind them, but they probably, and this would be true for soaker hoses as well, they probably need a black flow, uh, flow preventer. Okay, so that water cannot flow back in and contaminate because these things are under pressure and you don't want them to come in back in and contaminating the water line that's going to use sink where you may want to drink the water when you come inside. So our black flow preventer, you can buy these at a box store or a garden center. I don't know how many people have shown me ones that have busted open because they disconnect the hose from some reason in the winter, but they leave that connected to the faucet. So make sure you take that thing off before, and, uh, in late fall when it starts to turn color. It will bust in cold weather. Fertilizers. 
Uh, most important thing as a master gardener that you can recommend is a sloth. Um, I will see it probably uh, sometime later this summer. Uh, I just, uh, it's in review now, a fact sheet on nutrient deficiencies in roses and other abiotic issues and uh, also some genetic issues uh, that affect roses. And we won't go into a lot of that today, but I can tell you right now, one of the most important things that you can recommend to someone uh, with a vegetable garden or flower gardens of any type is a soil test. And, and when people have been growing roses for a long time, let me tell you what the soil test is going to show. They're going to be low in nitrogen because roses either take or consume a lot of nitrogen. And people love to add a lot of organic matter to their beds. And that raises the CN ratio, carbon-nitrogen ratios. And so nitrogen seems to always be in short supply. But they add a lot of fertilizers, and then the phosphorus will be in very high concentration over the years because phosphorus doesn't leach out of the beds very well. And so what happens is they're low on some things, all right on other things, and then they're high on others. And they're sitting there going, what fertilizer? And they go and they look at all the fertilizers and they can't find one that matches what they need to do for optimum growth. Well, you can go to a fertilizer company. And fortunately, we have one in East Tennessee that's located in Bradley County. And, and that is Beatty Fertilizer. And if you call them, and you send them the results of that soil test, just like a compounding pharmacist can make a, you know, maybe your doctor says, well, you can't have this high dose pill, but you need more than a low dose pill. So you go to a compounding pharmacist and they make that pill for you just the way you need it. Baby fertilizer for rosarians can compound and formulate a fertilizer specific to their soil test. And this is very, very often needed for old rose beds. Many times I have been asked about rose beds by a very frustrated rose grower because they said, the beds, I plant roses in them and they just don't do well anymore. I put a new bed in and they do fine, but the old bed just seems tired. It won't grow roses. 10 to one, Phosphorus has gotten so high that we're into phosphorus toxicity levels. And that can be very hard to correct. But one thing, what thing that will only make that worse is adding more phosphorus. And so this is what I'm talking about in cases like that. You may have to recommend that they go to our company. And I'm not just pushing Beatty. Of course, we lost Clayton, the founder of the company, just a few weeks ago. But I'm not just pushing that company, but that's one located in Bradley County that can make that specialized fertilizer for you. Now, organic fertilizers, rosarians like this. You're going to get asked if you're talking to rosarians about alfalfa tea. And alfalfa tea is just 10 or 12 cups of alfalfa pellets. And you fill up a 33 gallon garbage can and you let that just sit for a day, but never more than four days, okay? And you let it because microbial activity will take place and it'll stink the high heavens. And you just don't wanna do it. So one to four days, and uh, some people will put a cup of fish emulsion and a cup of liquefied seaweed in there as well. And uh, other people are just purists and just used alfalfa pellets. And uh, you want, and, and you people will be applying this in March and early April, and again in mid summer. Don't get it on the foliage. So, you know, I tell people a bucket, pour it around the base of the bush. Sometimes these teas will actually burn the foliage if you get them on the foliage. So, we don't want to get them on the foliage. Another organic fertilizer. A, uh, Mills Magic Mix uh, that was formulated by Ted Mills a long ago 
Uh, he, he made a deal with Bailey Fertilizer. They now make this thing sold all over the country and comes right out of Cleveland. And uh, this is probably the most popular uh, organic rose fertilizer on the market. And, you know, uh, some people like to make their own. Well, I'm not sure why, but for the red, green, do it yourselfers of the bunch, uh, it's 100 pounds of cottonseed meal, 100 pounds of fish meal, 50 pounds of alfalfa meal, 50 pounds of blood meal, and 50 pounds of bone meal. And then it's uh, about two cups of that around each rose bush. Knock yourself out. I'll just bag a, buy a bag of Mills Magic Mix and, uh, and do that myself. But, uh, but uh, you can buy it, rent a cement mixer and make your own. And uh, uh, I do get asked for that. And uh, because some people want to, they'll make smaller batches, but they like to make their own. Liquid feed. Yeah, this is what I do. Okay. Uh, it's more expensive, but it's safer. Why is it safer? Because you can't burn the plant with it if you follow the directions. Miracle Grow says on the box one tablespoon per gallon. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not so much into growing roses at home because of time in my job as I used to be. And I used to have 250 bushes and I had bought a little gasoline pump. If I was doing this today, it'd be an electric one. And uh, I would mix, I found that one of those tubes of miracle Grow uh, will supply enough miracle Grow for that 33 gallon garbage can. And I would mix it up with a canoe paddle as the water was running into the garbage can and then I would just, and I had timed out how long it took with my little pump to fill up a gallon jug. And I would sit there and count that out as I was watering each bush. And uh, you, you can't burn roses using liquid feed like that. There's many on the market. When there were Kmarts in our area, K uh, grow liquid fertilizer Chemically, was the exact same thing as Miracle Grow. It may have been a generic form of Miracle Grow, for all I know, but it uh, it worked just as well. Uh, inorganic fertilizers, 10, 10, 10. Yeah, a lot of people use that, and, and that's fine. But you got to watch that phosphorus over the time. Some people will spend the money on Osmocote. Osmocote is a cool thing to use, but remember this: if you use Osmocote in the heat of summer especially in a container. When it gets up around 90 degrees, all of that fertilizer is released all at once. And in a container, you could be dealing with soluble salt issues when that happens. So I say, if you're gonna use an Osmocote type fertilizer, make sure you use that thing in the spring where most of those pellets will be depleted by the time of summer. Never add Osmocote in the middle of summer. Pruners. Uh, roses uh, will produce more blooms if you prune them. That, that includes knockouts if you prune the old blooms off. And you want to use bypass pruners where the blade moves like this against each other when you do this. You don't want the anvil. The anvil will crush the stems. Uh, roses have a pithy stem, you know, just they're just white uh, parenchyma cells inside the stems. Uh, the vascular system is just inside the bark. And so uh, uh, the anvil things were pruned and the row stems uh, where the cuts were won't harden off when they've been crushed. So don't use that. Um, we have a problem with uh, metallic sweat bee type bees uh, that love to make nests and uh, freshly cut rose stems. Uh, we call them cane borers. Uh, they don't feed on the roses. They just make a home. And as far as they burrow down that stem, that stem will die. If it gets into the graft union, burrows all the way down that far, the graft union will die. Eventually will die. And the rose won't perform. I consider them, when they're in roses, to be arch demons from hell. But... They're important pollinators. So we don't want to kill them. 
We just want to discourage them to go to our neighbor's roses or somewhere else. And so when we make a cut, if the size of the cane is as big as the diameter of an ink pen or a pencil or larger, we're going to squirt a little wood glue on them. Now the wood glue will wear away, but uh, outside, but by that time the stem is hardened and then the bee moves somewhere else on its own. It doesn't matter what kind of wood glue you own, just get the cheapest one you can find. And here's another key, neatness does not count. So just put a squirt, if it starts to run down the stem, who cares? When it dries, it's clear anyway. So it's no big deal on that at all. But if you don't use it, you will deal with those very important bees that you will start referring to them as archdemons from hell because they will burr down your stem and kill the stems as far as they do. We'll see a picture of them in a little bit. Pruning. Don't make a level cut. Never recommend that. Now, don't get a protractor out when it shows a 45 degree cut. Just make a cut at a slope so that water will run off and not sit there. Okay. Now, when you put the glue on that, it is going to run down. But so what? There'll be a layer of glue across that thing as it runs down. But here is the most important thing about pruning. You see where it says one fourth inch from the top? I'm not too worried about that, but I am worried about this. You prune above a bud or a new little shoot that's coming out. Okay. In the base of that shoot will be a dormant bud, or maybe the shoot's not there and you can see just a dormant bud. Whatever direction that shoot is facing is the way that bud is going to grow out. So we don't want roses to grow like this as a gnarly mess of stems. We want them like this. So I'm, it may be a little higher than I want. It may be a little lower than I want. But I'm going to make my pruning cut where there is a bud growing out in the direction I want the new limb to go. That's very, very important. Very important. Pruning roses. How do you do it? Well, there's two things. Do you, you know, first thing I ask somebody, you want really big flowers or do you want a lot of flowers? If you're cutting the flowers for a rose show, you want really big flowers. If you want them for people to see in your yard or for bouquets, a lot of bouquets of roses and vases in your house or house or to give people, you want lots of roses. So hybrid teas. Uh, maybe 12 to 14 inches from the graft union. In the spring, if I want big roses, I might go to 18 inches or 20 inches if I want lots of roses. Uh, floor bunders, uh, probably a little higher than that, two to two and a half feet. Shrub roses, oh, what the heck, whatever. I usually say leave about a half of the bush. Climbing roses, this is sort of like crepe myrtles. Don't get me started on crepe murder, myrtle, uh, uh, crepe murder. But, but the whole thing here is we want to maintain the form of that climbing rose. But if there's a cane that dies or it's rubbing against another one or it slaps you in the face when you're mowing, that's one of the canes you want to get rid of. And the general rule of thumb is never take more than a third of your canes because for many of our climbing roses, they bloom on one year wood. So if you cut your climbing roses real low, it's a year before you're going to have a lot of blooms. You might have one or two, but you're not going to have many. So that's why you want to maintain that form. Miniatures. Oh, you can sit there and prune them like bush roses or shrub roses. Um, years ago, the late Hugh Wallace, who was, uh, he, he worked at the post office in Clinton, Tennessee one of the best rosarians I've ever met in my life. And when he got uh, too old to take care of his roses, I would go over on Saturday morning to help prune them. And I would, and when I started on the miniatures, he had so many. I was sitting there pruning, you know, just like I would a hybrid tease. He came out and said, what are you doing? 
And so we went to his garage, got his lawnmower, put the wheels on the highest setting, and he says, mow them. I did it because he said to, but I thought it was going to be a disaster. Six weeks later, his miniatures were beautiful. So with miniatures, pruning, anything goes. Okay. And this is what I'm talking about. You prune the 12 to 14 inches like these people did because they showed roses. Okay. Look what, look, look what they look like on May 20th, April 14th to May 20th. They look, they look like somebody has butchered them on the 14th of April. Look how magnificent their roses were May 20th. Okay. And you see, and this is April 14th, May 20th. Some years it's different because it's weather dependent. You know, when, uh, when, when we're getting near that last hard freeze date, you can look ahead, you know, we can go online now and, you know, whether people lie all the time, but you know, uh, now we can have them lie to us online at our convenience. We don't have to stay up for 11 o'clock and listen to them. And, uh, but uh, when they say, yeah, it looks like most of the hard freezes are over, I'm going to prune my roses. But that date may not be April 14th. It may be earlier, it may be later. But that time frame that you see here is going to remain about the same. Same different amount of weeks between pruning and full bloom. Now we get to disease. Now, I don't spend much time on that, and that pains me. But to be honest with you, disease and insects would have taken a whole seminar on their own. So not going to spend a whole lot of time. Black spot, rose, rosette are the two that you're going to worry about the most. Black spot's going to be the more common of the two. And uh, the main key with black spot is keep the foliage dry and have that open vase-shaped rose so that you get good air circulation. That's so important. The other thing, when, when I started growing roses, there was a lot of claims about black spot resistance by rose companies, and it wasn't true. But today, if a modern rose is listed as black spot resistant by the company, it most likely is. So, uh, so, that, so that works for us. Rose Rosette. Well, I doubt if they would because after this seminar, Stebbins is going to have, he's going to know and Evangeline's going to know, I'm not inviting him back again. But if they ever do, I would love to come back and talk about rose diseases and insects. By the way, top center, there's that cane borer. You can see the hole in the little insert that it makes in the top. But if you split that stem open carefully so that you don't, you don't mutilate the baby bees inside, you will see that what that mama bee did was she put some pollen, a lot of pollen in, and she laid an egg. And then she put more pollen in, and she made an egg. And more pollen and laid an egg. And those little bees, baby bees, will feed on that pollen and uh, pupate and then will emerge out of the top as a new bee. And, that's, and see, so she's just making a home to raise her babies. So we don't want to kill her. We just want to, you know, if I live next to Tom, I would want her to go to Tom's roses. And so I'll put, I will put, uh, the wood glue on mine, and they come around and go, crap, this isn't a good, pro I'm not digging through that. And so they'll go, they'll go destroy Tom's roses, and that won't bother me. Okay. And so uh, Japanese beetles can be a problem. But, you know, they never were a problem for me for two reasons. One, I never bought a Japanese beetle trap. Two, because those don't work, they just attract them. And two, Every morning when I got up, I went outside to see what new roses I had in bloom. And I took a little bitty bucket. It was just a little quart bucket that I got at a box store. And it had about an, two inches of water in it. So it wasn't very heavy. And I put a little squirt of, of dishwashing soap in it to break surface tension. You know, when you disturb a Japanese beetle, it doesn't fly off like that it drops about a foot and then flies. 
Well, if I hold it right below the bloom and tap where the beetle is, it drops into the bucket since there's no surface tension. It takes about 10 minutes for them to drown. Now, if you like it, if, if you don't like them, like I don't, you can sit there and enjoy that 10 minutes while you drink a cup of coffee and watch them slowly drown. Now, what's even better is don't take the dead ones out. The next day, when you're doing that again, when the beetle drops in, they can see the corpses of the other one. So they know it's hopeless and they're going to die. You can actually torture them. Not a bad thing to do to Japanese beetles. Now, I do that once in the morning. And I do that once before sunlight. I mean, day, uh, sundown. 250 rose bushes, it would take me about 10 minutes. There wasn't that many beetles. And they never accumulated. Because here's something else, and this is a misnomer. Japanese beetles do not attract other Japanese beetles. No, you, that pheromone is not a sex pheromone in those traps. What attracts them is volatiles released by feeding. The damage they do to bushes attracts others. It's sort of like me when I'm driving. A crowd of people doesn't get me hungry, but you let me drive across by a barbecue pl place has barbecue cooking outside, and I'm immediately hungry. I wasn't attracted by the people. I was attracted by the barbecue. The beetles are attracted by the damage that's done to feed it. Okay? So by doing that once in the morning and once in the afternoon, I never had very much damage, so I really didn't have that many beetles to begin with. A very easy tip. And the last thing before I stop, is roses have thorns. <laughs> I've certainly been tore up enough, so I know this. Those soft cloth gloves, they'll protect your hands from blisters on a shovel. They're a disaster when you're dealing with roses. Uh, the leather gloves, I, as a little boy, I call those engineer gloves because they, they look like the gloves that railroad engineers used. And uh, you see these a lot of construction sites are made out of leather. They, they work pretty well, but they don't extend up your arms. Most garden centers, you can get rose gloves. And that, 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 I have a pair that goes right up almost to my elbow. Okay. And uh, they're made out of material that really stops the punctures. So uh, I got this picture off the web of this young lady. Why in the world would you be gardening in white shorts? That's obviously a model. Nobody would do that. Well, they won't stay white for very long if you're doing any serious work with that shovel. Okay. But short sleeve shirts, T-shirts, pruning roses, even in the summertime. I do that early in the morning. Put a long sleeve shirt on. Uh, pretty heavy material. Long pants. Uh, like the lady has down in the bottom. She also has on rose gloves, you notice. She's ready to go to work. And look at that yellow arrow. Can you see that? See where she's made those cuts? There's a squirt of wood glue. See that belt she's got on? You can't see it because of her right hand. But I guarantee you, she's got a little host of there. It's got a bottle of wood glue in it. So she makes all her cuts, and then she squirts them with wood glue. Okay? And then... And then when she needs her hands for her, she's using loppers instead of hand pruners. She just drops that wood glue in that little holster. And, you know, it, it, it sort of makes you feel like a cowboy. I've seen many people with all kinds of holsters, you know, and they got that wood glue in it. So anyway, this has been a seminar on Rose's clean, Queen of Flowers, how to grow them. And, uh, Yvonne John doesn't know me very well. Tom does. So, uh, yeah, this is usually the way I look. And my uh, bark is a whole lot worse than my bite. I have an English bulldog who's snoring right at my feet. I don't know if you can hear him or not, but he's there, and he's doing that. So I'm partial to that. So if anybody's had got a question in chat. Thanks, Mark. Thank you question? very much. And then um, Diane says, my climbing rose, which I planted last spring, has healthy canes that head for the sky, leaving the bottom of the plant relatively leaf free. 
Any tricks to keeping a climber full all the way up? Spray with a fungicide for black spot. If their leaves have black spots on them, the ones that are still on there, because foliation from black spots starts at the bottom of the bush and it's extremely common on floors, on, uh, on climbers. Uh, the other thing is, is that climbers will drop leaves, especially from the bottom, if they're in the shade any part of the day. So that, that's, that's another issue with, with them, okay? But most, oh, and they will drop it if they dry out. So adequate water, full sun, and uh, get on a fungicide regime if it's not resistance. And here's the problem. Practically all climbers are susceptible to black spot. And that's an issue. And they have not received the breeding attention that hybrid teas and floribundas have because there's just not as much of a market for it. So there hasn't been as much attention of producing disease resistant climbers as there have been hybrid teas, floribundas, and shrub roses. Yes, sir. Someone asked, is it too early to prune knockout roses? Yeah, because it's too dang cold out to be outside. Okay, I mean, it, it's, it's, I don't know about y'all, but uh, no. Uh, we're going to, you know, here in Knoxville, um, let's see. Right now, oh, we have now gone above freezing. It's 33 degrees outside. No, I'm not going to be pruning in this. However, next week it's going to be in the 50s. So, yeah, it'd be fine. Okay, so I guess you can always uh, think about your personal preference. You don't have to strain yourself out in the cold if it's <laughs> no, <laughs> waiting no, 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 no. This is fun. This, this, this isn't rocket science. Knockouts you can prune in the middle of summer. I swear you can't kill the dang thing. <laughs> okay. All right. Who else has a question? Uh, we have a question from Kay Lansford asking, what would happen if I cut the rose limbs down to the original wood? Would that invigorate them or kill them? Well, it's not, it's probably not going to do either. Uh, the farther you cut them back, the fewer uh, stems you're going to have, the fewer roses you're going to have, but they're going to be bigger ones. Uh, roses are pretty, are pretty resilient about pruning. Uh, most, you know, I've had people that I've had to tell them prune back to 12 inches in July. Why? Because they been growing susceptible roses. They had black spot and it was so bad. I told them they had to start over. So they pruned hard back in July, had a great fall bloom and the roses did fine after that. You know, in Corrington, if you, if you live in Knox County, you would know Corrington. Corrington is almost to uh, Granger County. It's on the far Eastern edge of Knox County, North Knox County. And there was a lady there. I visited her house. This was many years ago. Uh, she sent me a specimen to look at, and it was black spot, just black spot. And I called her, and she said, I've been growing roses for 20 years, and I've never had this disease. I couldn't believe it. So that's why I went to her house. And her house was in the middle of a gigantic pasture. There were no roses or no neighbors anywhere near this thing. It was a huge piece of property. And her roses were ancient. And she had had these roses for over 20 years and they had never experienced black spot. But her son had given her two new rose bushes at Mother's Day and she planted them and she introduced black spot in and it went like crazy all over her roses. Mm. And I had to tell her, you going to have to prune all these things back and start over. And then I outlined a spray program for her, and she started to cry. Mm. Okay. So she'd never had to do it before. But so roses, pruning them back. Yeah, you can do it just about any time. Now, invigorating, deadheading, cutting that old bloom off. Oh, yeah, that will invigorate. And that is a type of pruning. You don't have to cut all the way back to the wood. Just cut back to that bud where that next shoot comes out in the direction you want it to go. Someone asks if they can use hedge clippers on their knockouts. Sure. Okay. I wouldn't use them on a hybrid tea, but knockouts are tough. Sure. You can do that. A goat would do it too. <laughs>
Okay. Who else has a question? Um, we have a question from Ann Haggood um, asked, saying, I have a dogwood question. We're on Signal Mountain and would like to put in dogwoods all over town. There are particular ones, are there particular ones you'd recommend that will be anthracnose resistant? Yes. Appalachian Spring. Appalachian Spring is the one I got arrested over. <laughs> uh, it was not a seedling. Well, it was a seedling in the sense at one time it was, but when I saw Appalachian, what with the tree that was going, to, whose vegetative cuttings were and, budded, and buds were going to become Appalachian Spring, it was about 12, 13 feet high, and it had branches in a tangle with a bunch of dogwoods, but dogwood and fracnose had killed. And I knew it had killed them because the dead ones had tons of dead apricormic shoots, and they were the elliptical cankers from dogwood and fracnose all over their trunks because the bark had fallen off. They had died years before. And there's Appalachian Spring growing to beat the bass. Now, Appalachian Spring was originally, we were going to call it the presidential dogwood because it came so close from the gates of Camp David. So why didn't we do that? Or were we... You know, maybe I sh maybe I should become a fortune teller because I decided presidential dogwood was not a good name because no matter who was in the White House, about half the people wouldn't like them and wouldn't buy a tree called presidential dogwood. Okay, so we changed the name to Appalachian Spring, and uh, and and it is the only tree on the market that has been tested and found resistant to dogwood and fracnose. It will get some spots, but here's a whole key, and that's for a whole different lecture on disease resistance. Appalachian spring is not immune. It will get a few, it's not an oak tree, so it will get dogwood and fracnose, but it'll have just a few spots and you won't even notice them. Unless you're a plant nerd and you go out and you go, oh my God, Look, dogwood and fracnose, dogwood and fracnose, and I'm going to say, is 90% of the foliage okay? Yes. Is the tree vigorous? Yes. Is the tree dying? No. It's resistant. Appalachian spring. Now, if it's powdery mildew, it's your issue. Not on Signal Mountain, but down in the in the lowlands of Chattanooga, and fracnose isn't going to be the issue for powdery mildew is. You've got Cherokee Brave, Appalachian Snow, Appalachian Mist, Appalachian Blush, and Appalachian Joy. They're all resistant to powdery mildew. Appalachian Spring, only one resistant to dogwood and fracnose, and it is moderately resistant to mildew. Well, um, Miss Tammy Fisk was wondering, are there special climbers good for this region? Yeah, there are. Uh, most of the climbers would be great for this region. But you really want to know the good ones? Find a retail garden center that's been in business for more than five years. Because what they have done is they've been selling climbers for a while and they have learned from customers' complaints which ones to grow and which ones not to grow, okay? And when I buy roses, it wouldn't be fair for me to say which, which retail garden center I use, but I drive about 90 minutes to this retail garden center because I know that the only climbers they're going to sell are ones that are good in this area. Now, another way to find out where you are, and the reason why I'm hedging here, you are in one of the most difficult areas to advise. I wouldn't be in Tom Stebbins' shoes if the sweet Lord Jesus came down and asked me to, okay? And that comes from driving Miss Daisy, but you get the point. And the reason for that is he has to advise people who are down in the lowlands and people up on Lookout Mountain and Missionary Ridge. And what does well in downtown Chattanooga may not do well on his side of Rock City. Okay, so, and, and the same thing's going to be true for climbers. Some do much better in, in heat that will be experienced in downtown Chattanooga or somewhere in a neighborhood near that, 
or versus up on top of the mountain or on top of the ridge. And so uh, another way to do that is Tri-State Road Society. You can look them up online and you can email them. They have consulting Rosarians that are just begging for you to somebody to contact them. They're like Maytag repairmen, you know, that old commercial. And so you contact them and say, which climbers do best? First thing they're going to ask you is, you on the mountain ridge or you down below? And once you tell them that, they're going to give you a whole list. You are in a very dicey area. Same thing's true in Bradley County. It's not quite as extreme, but there are some real severe ridges on the eastern side of Bradley County. Okay. Who else has a question? Um, well, Marion had mentioned that you can order online at milmix.com for baby fertilizer. So I'm just going to throw that out there for anyone who has not been um, able to look at the comments section. When is a good time to purchase container roses and put them out? Ah, when is the best time to put them out? Well, I like buying, buying them in April, early April. I like them to have buds on them, but I don't want blood. I don't want full bone blooms. I want to maximize the length of the time of that bloom. Now, I want them in the ground for at least a month or six weeks before it gets really hot. So my goal on that is to have them in the ground for at least a month, maybe six weeks before June 1st. Now, it's okay. You may have to doctor them a little bit to buy them the week after Mother's Day. Why is that? Because roses go down in price big time after Mother's Day. Okay? If you're one of those people who go to a store to buy a Christmas wrap after Christmas for next Christmas because it's so cheap, you are the person who will be buying roses the week after Mother's Day. You'll, you'll understand that concept completely. Okay? What's the next question? Uh, Fernando Granada says, I realized I cut mine the wrong way. Should I go over and prune them properly? No, it's like a haircut. You know, you get a bad haircut, let the hair grow. Then cut it again, and then go get a good haircut. Okay? From somewhere else. Or hopefully, whoever cut it the first time, has learned from the disaster that they did. It's sort of like me. I've got an English bulldog now, so he doesn't suffer from it. But I've had papillons, and I would give those long-haired little turkeys, uh, you know, uh, a haircut, and it looked like bloody heck. And, uh, but the hair always grew back, and then they looked fine. So, uh, no, I wouldn't be in a hurry to run out there and change that. Let them grow out. You'll be surprised. And then if you, and the next time you prune, you have learned something better. Okay. Who else has a question? Well, uh, our final question here and, and everyone, if you have any more questions, please, this is the time to go ahead and add that into the chat. But we have a question saying, we love our dogwoods. We're new to the area and they're growing under pines. We would love to keep them healthy. Any suggestions? Maybe this is not appropriate at this time. <laughs> It's always appropriate to ask about a dogwood. Okay, first of all, good for you. They're growing under pines. Have you ever noticed where dogwoods grow in the wild? They grow in the woods, the edge of woods. They're in partial shade to shade. When they're in shade, they don't have as much problem with boars. So, so good for you. Full shade dogwoods, well, they tend to have a problem. Here is the most important thing you can do for any dogwood, full sun or full shade. Number one, if you're buying a new one, don't plant it too deep. If you can't see the top of the top root, it's too deep. Number two, do not get near them with a string type weed eater device. Okay, hardwood soft bark. Uh, don't, you know, have big mulched areas, not volcanoes, but mulch areas around your trees. And you say, how big? Who mows your yard? If you do it and you're careful, they don't have to be very big. If you have a teenager that does it, 
or even worse, one of these NASCAR-type pit crews known as a lawnmower service. Have you ever watched them when they show up? NASCAR pit crews could take lessons from these lawn services when they show up. They jump off the truck and they get up and everything's put back in place and they're gone. Okay. They mow so fast. Yeah, they're going to probably nick your trees. And let me tell you something. You nick a tree with a lawnmower or a weed eater, 50-50 chance that tree's dead in two years. Okay. So... What are you going to do? Pines, under pines, you're in great shape. If they've already been nicked for by, by previous owners, you know, with weed eaters and lawnmowers, just pray for them. They probably will make it if they're still there. If, you, if, they, if the bark looks intact to the base, don't do it yourself and you'll be fine. Okay. Any, anybody else got something? something? Well, so far that is all the questions that I'm seeing. Well, yeah, isn't also, that good? They're probably hungry. <laughs> I haven't seen too many people eat. I was also going to say a lot of people said that they love the lesson. They learned a lot. Um, they're inspired. They, they need to get out more. <laughs> hey, Mark, I want to thank you for zooming down here to Chattanooga. And I want to say, it, yeah, it's been a pleasure working down in Chattanooga. It's God's country up here, even though we've when I go up on lookout or signal and look at somebody's yard, um, all they have to do is look out over the over uh, the beautiful. Oh, it is. When I was doing all that dogwood and fracnose research on lookout and signal mountain, uh, gosh, it was wonderful. It was beautiful. Yeah. It was also a lot cooler. Yeah, it's beautiful up there. Now we're getting a little bit of boxwood blight up, up around through there, too. So, I wouldn't uh, doubt it. Yeah. Wouldn't doubt it at all. But again, thank you very much for coming down. And enjoyed it. We really enjoyed your your presentation. Yeah. All right, guys. It's been fun. I'm going to cut out. Bye-bye. Have a great day. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye -bye.